Thanks, um, Tommaso. Um, scusami di non parlare italiano. Allora, uh, let me begin by uh, paying a tribute to my collaborator, uh, Ugo Valdre. Uh, unlike me, Ugo is a scholar, uh, a distinguished professor at the University of Bologna, who's made significant contributions to the literature on electron microscopy. This lecture relies almost entirely on his application of scientific methods to a historical question. By accumulating and tabulating evidence scattered over hundreds of pages, Ugo has revealed a hitherto unknown and close relationship between Giacomo Quarenghi and the painter and architect Vincenzo Valdre, who was born in Faenza, but who came from, or was educated in Parma. All I have to do is tell the story. The story begins as a 20-year-old Englishman called Richard Norris enters the city of Rome on the evening of the 18th of December, 1770. It's almost dark, but he writes in his diary, what little I could see by the light was very elegant. Almost everything you'll hear today comes from his diaries, which are now in the British Library in London, which Norris kept between late 1770 and late 1772. Two volumes of drawings collected by Norris on his travels are also in London in the Victoria and Albert Museum. These drawings are by many hands, mostly anonymous, but including, I believe, work by Quarenghi. Another two volumes of drawings are in the Centre for British Art at Yale. They are by um, Norris's travelling companion, the Welsh architect James Lewis, also 20 years old, soon to be a significant figure in British architecture. Lewis kept a diary too, written in Italian, but he was annoyed by how poor his command of the language was, and he burnt it. Uh, so, the four volumes of Norris di Diaries are our main source. They're mostly set in Rome, but they include descriptions of visits to distant architectural and archaeological sites, the ruins at Paestum, for instance, and to a variety of places closer to Rome, the Villa Farnese, for instance, at Caprarola. Everywhere he goes, Norris measures and draws buildings. He is a serious student. He studies Italian with a private tutor. He's taught the violin by Polani, a leading virtuoso, and he keeps up a correspondence with artists and scientists back in England, including his first tutor, James Athenian Stewart, the pioneer of the Greek style in Europe. Norris returned home in 1772. There he had a successful career in London and was a founder member of the Architects Club the first of its kind in England. But when in 1792, following the death of his wife, he shot himself, the coroner, he was age 42, the coroner described him as a lunatic, un pazzo, un lunatico. The diaries are full of information, but they're also very frustrating. Flor uh, Norris doesn't even tell us where he lived in, in Rome. We do know that the apartment he shared with James Lewis and two live-in servants was somewhere near the uh, Spanish steps in the, on the Piazza di Spagna uh, and was large enough to host a party of 80 guests on one occasion. But let's return to the narrative. On their arrival in Rome, Norris and Lewis are immediately taken by courier to see Sir Horace Mann the British ambassador to Firenze, who rents them expensive rooms in his house. The next day, Norris begins to find a cheaper place and to meet almost 
every English, Scottish, Welsh, and Irish artist then working in Rome. The only Italian artist he visits is Giambattista Piranesi. The next Italian he tries to meet four days after his arrival is Vincenzo Valdre. Unfortunately, he's not at home. So Norris and Lewis go off on a trip to Napoli. When they return to Rome in the middle of January, Norris, I quote, delivered a letter to Signore Valdre Pittore. The next day, the 19th of January, 1771, Valdre comes to lunch, bringing with him Giacomo Quarenghi and the Irish painter and antiquarian Matthew Nolte, a considerable figure in Roman art politics. This is serious business. Norris and Lewis have come to Rome to study, and they need to employ a maestro. At the age of 66, Nolte is too old for the job. He's probably there as a fixer, un intermediario, un mezzano. So, the competition is between Quarenghi and Valdre. Quarenghi is a formidable rival. He has already designed the chapel at the Benedictine Monastery in Subiaco, and he is soon to design another chapel for Wardour Castle in England, a prestigious commission. But who is Vincenzo Valdre? Here he is in a portrait by William Cumming, uh, painted in 1800, now in the National Gallery in, in Dublin. Valdre was then 60 years of age, a friendly, amusing, but very private man, keeping off intruders with his brushes, especially his biographers. In 1800, uh, Valdre was still working on what, on what is now re recognized as the most important history painting in Ireland, Three Quadri Riportati, which filled the ceiling of St. Patrick's Hall in Dublin Castle. And he was, or he had been, a famous architect. Uh, this is a de detail of the painting in, in Dublin Castle, very Italian, not very Irish. This is, this is the marble saloon in Stowe. Um, it was begun a mere four years after uh, Valdre met Norris in Rome. But as far as we know, Norris never designed any building in Rome or in Parma or anywhere else in Italy. In 1771, he should not have been any competition for Quarenghi. Valdre, though, understood what architecture could do uh, to people. In, in 1765, his parents' home was demolished to make way for a new pa uh, palace, indeed, an entire city for the Duke of Parma. The designer of that city was Enimond Alexandre Petito, an architect whose genius is certainly comparable to that of Quarenghi. We think Valdre was his pupil. But what Valdre was known for was his abilities as a visual artist. In Parma's prestigious art competition in 1764, he won first prize for this drawing of Egar nel deserto consolato dal Angelo. And in the following year, he won first prize for this painting, Sileno addormentato in un antro e legato con ghirlande da satiretto. Despite Quarenghi's soaring reputation, Norris and Lewis chose Valdre to be their teacher. From then on, the diaries record almost every day little more than drawing with Valdre or drawing at Valdre's. But it would be a mistake to see Quarenghi as the loser in a contest with Valdre. On the contrary, we think, Ugo and I think, they were partners. And when Norris and Lewis were drawing at Valdres, they were attending, I think, his private academy. 
and Quarengi was working with Valdre or for him. What follows concentrates on Quarengi's part in the enterprise. Two days after their lunch together, Norris tells his diary, met Signore Giacomo, bought some paper. The next day, Quarengi calls and Norris writes that, I paid him for some shoes and made him a present. The day after that, they deliver a letter to the English College, the Jesuit institution, and then go to listen to music in the Church of San Giacomo degli Spagnoli on the Piazza Navona. The following day, Quarengi comes for breakfast. Then he and Norris call on Valdre and go with him to see the Colosseum and the Pantheon, then to the English coffee house and finally to the theater. On the 30th of January, 1771, Norris begins to work. He draws a sketch of a chimney piece and gives it to Quarengi to turn the design into a finished drawing. They, they then go to measure what uh, we think was the arch of Costantino. After that, Norris brings, uh, Quarengi brings Norris and Lewis to an instrument maker's shop to buy equipment for their course in architecture. Over the next three months, Quarengi and Norris become friends. They dine together, go to concerts, visit the English co uh, coffee house, see many important buildings and works of art. But the friendship is also businesslike. On the 12th of March, for instance, Norris goes to see Giacomo and pays him for drawing the Colosseum. In April, Quarengi and Norris are still measuring the Colosseum. At the end of the month, they turn their attention to the Pantheon. By the 5th of May, the diary says, Giacomo brought me the plan of the rotunda for which Norris pays him 48 paoli, just short of five gold scudi, roughly what a professor of fine art then earned in a week. The next day, Norris, Lu and Lewis, and Quarengi measure the portico of the Pantheon with the use of a ladder. This is a detail from the drawing in the Norris uh, volumes in the VNA. You can see that it's uh, written in French. Uh, so we, we think that it was probably the language that they, they used between them, Norris and Quarengi. On the day this drawing was done, Quarengi brings Norris and Lewis to the house of James Byers on the Via Paulina. Quarengi shows Byers a drawing of the rotunda of the Pantheon. Since Byers is a major art dealer, and since almost every major artist since Giovanni Paolo Panini has depicted the rotunda, Quarengi must think his drawing is in the same class. Giacomo is a confident young man. After that, work continues on the Pantheon, and so too uh, does their eating and drinking and going to concerts. On the 12th of May, for instance, Norris and Lewis dine at home with Quarengi Valdre, the great Swedish sculptor Johann Tobias Sergel, and the significant but neglected French painter Esprit Antoine Giblin. I'll return to Giblin and Sergel in a moment, but let me continue what the diaries say about Quarengi. On Sunday, the 9th of June, he has breakfast with Norris and Lewis, pays a visit to the important art dealer Thomas Jenkins, and is introduced to Sir William Hamilton, the British ambassador to Napoli. After that, Quarengi disappears for almost eight months. Let me pause here to show you an image of Valdre as a young man. We've seen it, uh, we've seen it earlier, and I, I show it to you to ask a question which some Quarengi expert may be able to answer. The image uh, is, I think, more misogynistic and lacking in joy 
than it is pornographic. But pornographic it is. The recumbent figure is Valdre. The, the man wrestling with the woman is Giblin. Uh, this is Johann Tobias de Sergel, a, a sort of a giant. And the masochistic voyeur on his knees is John Francis Rigo, a painter of genius born in Torino who lived most of his life in London and was a neighbor of Valdre there. Actually, I often wonder, well, some people, I, I know it's been thought that possibly this man at the back pouring the wine might be Giacomo Quarenghi. I, I, I doubt it myself. I doubt it. Actually, I often wonder, was Valdre a participant in this, in this orgy? After, after all, it's an imaginary, it's an imaginary or, orgy, a classical fantasy, not a depiction of an actual event. And taking part in, in it would have been very dangerous for Valdre because from 1768 until we think 1770, he was a pensionnaire at the Académie Française, and you could be expelled from the Academy for not attending Mass at Easter and not taking communion. But let's look at something a little bit more pleasant. And this is, but also psychologically disturbing, this is James Payne, senior and junior. Um, James Payne Sr. was a frightening man, a man with a, a fierce temper, and I think you can sense it in his son, who's very, who seems to me to be a very nervous young man. He was also a brilliantly promising artist, and he uh, came to Rome shortly after this picture was painted and stayed there until at least 1774. He certainly knew Norris in London, they were founder members of the Architects Club. It seems to me likely that Quarenghi got the Warder Castle Commission partly because of his friendship with James Jr. His father was the main architect uh, on, on Warder Castle. So why was Valdre uh, not offered work there too? After all, the owner of the castle, Lord Arundel, and his agent in Rome, the Jesuit priest father, John Thorpe, were buying work by almost every artist and craftsman in the city, including Pompeo Battoni. And here is Pompeo Battoni's copy of Guido Reni's Aurora in the ceiling of the music room in Warder Castle. It's a curious... Uh, error in art history that Valdre is said to have painted Guido Reni's Aurora in the ceiling of Stowe. We know that he, he, he drew it, either he drew it or Norris drew it uh, using a mirror uh, so the image is reversed. Um, but Valdre didn't paint the, 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 uh, this painting for the ceiling of, of Stowe. This is what he painted. It's the Dance of the Hours, a long lost painting, uh, discovered a couple of years ago, and this was it just before it went back up into the, the ceiling in Stowe. It's in the music room. You can see the uh, decorative wall paintings are also by, by Valdre, a, a very beautiful room. And sometimes I wonder, how could Italy have forgotten uh, Valdre? I think Valdre was not commissioned to do work for Warder Castle by Father Thor Thorpe because Valdre was from Parma, and the Jesuits had been driven out of the duchy in 1768. In 1771, Parma was still agitating to destroy the Order of Jesus, the Society of Jesus. And as part of that campaign, Pope, the Pope Clement XIV 
placed Father Thorpe under house arrest in the English College in 1773. Politically, Valdre would not have been popular with Thorpe or with the Arundel family, one of the most powerful Roman Catholic families in England. Coming from Bergamo was a, an advantage to Quarengi. The, the Jesuits had been in the city since 1543 and stayed there until the 25th of March last year when the order closed its house for the last time, the house situated, ironically, on the Via Quarengi. So, if I ask the scholars, if Quarengi had come from Parma, would he have been asked to design the Warder Castle? I think not. Let me mention briefly that on the 2nd of November, 1771, while Quarengi was not in Rome, Norris writes this in his diary. Received a visit from three Russian officers who brought a letter from Mr. Clarisi. I think Mr. Clarisi was the French architect Charles-Louis Clarisseau, and that the Russian officers were trying to lure either Quarengi or Valdre, or perhaps both, to come to work for Catherine the Great in St. Petersburg. So, by the beginning of 1772, Quarengi was back in Rome. We know this because Norris visited him on the 20th of January. But Giacomo doesn't appear in the diaries again until the 4th of March, when Norris met him and Valdre. From then until the 31st of May, Quarengi appears in the diaries 17 times. Some of these encounters are very interesting. On one occasion, for instance, he and Norris went to the new museum at Belvedere, the Museo Pio Clementino, and examined how stucco was made for the exterior, made with lime, pozzolano, marble dust, sometimes gesso, but without the addition of hair as a binding agent. There's also a detailed account of a day when Norris Quarenghi and Valdre spent in parts of the Vatican normally not open to the public. That, that was on the 31st of May. Two days later, Norris and Lewis left Rome for the last time, never to return. They traveled across the country to Pesaro, where they sailed to Venezia, arriving there on the 11th of June. A month later, on the 15th of July, Quarengi and his brother, Father Anselmo, called on Norris at his hotel on the Grand Canal. From then until the end of September, Norris and Lewis were with Quarengi almost every day. And when he was not in their company, he was very close by. During that time, they visited an immense number of buildings and drew and measured them. Unfortunately, I, I only have time to show you without pausing um, some of the drawings from the, uh, from the volumes in, in the V&A. This is Il Redentore by Palladio, drawn either by Norris or Quarengi. Um, th this is Sant'Antonio a Padua. I think the handwriting here is by Quarengi, uh, a decorative drawing, another decorative drawing, a, an architectural drawing, the Palazzo Stopani in Rome, Norris or Quarengi. Uh, these are tools in the in, in illustration, and uh, apparently the, the, the dialect is Bergamesco, uh, so I think the hand is by uh, Quarengi. Uh, let me mention just one thing interesting about, uh, before we get to uh, um, uh, Norris and Lewis in Bergamo. On the, 20, on the 5th of August, Norris paid a visit to the studio of Pier Antonio Novelli in Venezia and saw the painting he was then completing, La Famiglia di Enea, 
and he was, it was a commission for Catherine the Great. At this time, Ca Catherine was paying out fabulous amounts of money for works of art. Etienne Falconet, the sculpt French sculptor, for example, who was then sculpting the bronze horseman, the, the great equestrian statue of Peter the Great in St. Petersburg, was offered 300,000 livres for the work. Korengi would have been very interested in what Novelli was getting, but as usual, Norris says nothing. But he has a lot to say about Bergamo. On the 4th of September, he and Lewis arrive in the city where they are met by Corengi's brothers, Father Anselmo and Francesco Maria, a lawyer, and installed in an, an apartment acquired for them by Francesco. The next day they are, I, re, I quote, received with great civility by Corengi's father. Immediately after this meeting, Norris goes straight to the post office where he receives a letter from Valdre in Rome. Norris then writes, not to Valdre, but to Valdre's father, Carlo, in Parma. Now, this is surprising. In the course of 21 months, the diaries have never mentioned the Valdre family. Yet, here is Norris on intimate terms with both the Quarengis and the Valdres. What could Norris have said in his letter to Carlo Valdre? We don't know. Norris does say, though, that he has just received a letter from Rome, this time from Matthew Nulti, the intermediary at the first meeting with Valdre and Quarengi in January 1771. It looks like Nulti is trying to fix them up with a job, perhaps in London, perhaps with the help of the leading English sculptor, sculptor Joseph Nollikens. Well, Norris had a letter of introduction from uh, Nollikens to, to a father, Perselli, in, in Venice. There are letters between Perselli and Norris all the way on the, their, their tour through, uh, back to Milano. I mentioned just one other uh, person that they meet, there is Pietro Edwards. Pietro Edwards appears 60 times in, the, in these two months. He is, of course, the great conservator of paintings in Venice and a person of great interest to, uh, um, to Quarenghi. And he also meets the architect Ottavio Bertotti Scamozzi. So it's not surprising. Uh, um, Edwards goes on the trip with them as far as Padua. They, they travel to, to Padua together. Um, finally, they, they leave, um, uh, Norris and Lewis leave Bergamo with, uh, Lewis goes with Quarenghi and uh, uh, Norris follows on ho horseback. They arrive in Genoa, they uh, Norris receives a letter from Valdre. He writes a reply to Corengi, to, to, to Valdre, then to Corengi's father. Then he hurries to the post office to see can he find out when is the courier going to Rome. Then he goes back and writes to Corengi's father. And that is the end of the affair. The, on Sunday, the 4th, of October, Norris and Lewis sailed from Geneva to Antibes in France, and there the, the diaries end. Uh, Quarengi never went to England. Why was that? Did he intend to go with Norris and Lewis? Surely not. Perhaps the trip to Milano was just a working holiday. Perhaps the, all the letters flying back and forth were just a banal correspondence. But uh, let, let me conclude with a, a, that was the end, as far as we know, but let me con conclude with, a, with a, a rather melancholy uh, note. This is Quarengi in 1811 by Alexander Orlovsky. Um, in, in Russia, one of Quarengi's great friends was Charles Whitworth, the first Earl of, uh, of Whitworth, and uh, 
at the end of his Quirin, uh, Whitworth was a great diplomat, very important in the history of Europe. But at the end of his career, he was sent off to Ireland, a very, very uh, low, low post. And there, did he, ma did he meet um, uh, Valdre in, in Dublin? Valdre was then an old uh, man. He had been attacked by banditi and was, was shortly at, thereafter to die. Perhaps uh, Whitworth would have gone to the funeral. We don't know. We don't even know where um, Valdre is buried in, in Dublin. But perhaps some scholar will search in the uh, Quarengi papers and find that Valdre, Norris, and Lewis are there. It's just that we don't know at the moment. Grazie. E ringraziamo Brian Lynch e naturalmente il professore Valdré per questa focalizzazione su questa relazione speciale no? che c'è stata per un arco di due anni tra questi personaggi e, e ora passo la parola a Pier Valeriano Angelini che ci farà a sua volta una focalizzazione su questi disegni no? che hanno eh, come dire, por, posto delle questioni di, di, eh, in relazione proprio alla, alla eh, individuazione no? degli, dei, degli autori e quindi farà un discorso legato a... Eh, 